Welcome everybody to what will be episode, am I pointing in the right way, 218 on our CX-CC YouTube channel, My Job Service Design, part of a series we're doing where people are going to talk about different jobs they do, uh, both for people who are curious about that kind of work, as well as for some of our cross-functional teammates who just don't get what we do, and they can quietly watch this video and pretend they know things. Um, before we get started, as always, I want to Thank all of our wonderful Patreon members. Um, we've got a free and a paid Patreon. You're welcome to join whichever you prefer. The paid starts at one American dollar per month. Um, and so thank you to all of our paid Patreons and our free ones as well. You are the first to know everything. And in fact, we're recording this right now. Patreon members, paid Patreon members will get it for two weeks and then it will go up on our YouTube channel. So check it out uh, later on. Uh, oh, I forgot to take that off the screen. I love my Patreon so much. Okay. Uh, I, it's still not off the screen. I'm pressing all the wrong buttons today. Okay, there we go. UX, clap, clap, clap. So today we are absolutely thrilled to pieces to have the always interesting uh, Thomas Wilson joining us. So let's just jump right in and say hello and tell us all about you. Hi. So I'm Thomas Wilson. I have been some form of designer for over 30 years before that, uh, I had a short stint as a librarian. I know, nerdy, right? Um, Dewey Decimal System, early 90s, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, uh, I basically start off, uh, started off in a lot like a lot of traditionalists in design in the early 90s, doing the whole art director to creative director track. Um, but I quickly understood that I was a little bit different animal. Um, I didn't get diagnosed until later in life with autism. I, I, I have, I'm ASD1, so sometimes I'm passable <laughs> and I can mask well, but um, when I get frustrated or upset or I feel a little triggered, that's usually when you can see it kind of comes out sideways and it looks a little bit like anger. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, I turned all of that in, in, in the way that I vi ha have like this visual thinking thing that happens with my brain and I can see patterns and pictures and I know it's really weird, but I see things in terms of patterns. Um, and I turned that quickly into a, more of a systems thinking type of um, uh, uh, notion with regards to my career. And so I started to really look at data and look at complex systems. And while all my other friends were really just designing like websites and things like that, I started to design like really complex schematics and um, uh, complex like interaction uh, uh, digital boards for everything from uh, musical equipment all the way up to like deer raiders and like um, uh, giant plants in Houston and power plants like control boards. And then I did it uh, uh, for a little bit. I did some heavy design work for NASA. And from there, I went in and, and came back and started doing more uh, things like uh, employee experience and, and customer experience before it really had all these buzzwords, right? But I was dipping in and out of the different types of service design and uh, doing that organizational stuff and that employee experience, I got to negotiate with um, unions uh, through the, the, the largest retailers in the world. And I also got to get experience creating intranets and, and things like that, and just solving really complex problems for businesses and employees. And, uh, you know, sometime around, I don't know, early 2000s, I discovered the term service design, and I realized that I was doing bits and pieces of it already. I probably wasn't doing the facilitation stuff as much, and maybe that's because of my particular brain or because I'm not really much for being um, the center of attention. I don't like being at the front of the class, and I don't like being on camera. I like being the director and the person who's behind the scenes kind of running things, the writer, the producer. The, I like writing songs. I don't like performing them. <laughs> so um, uh, all of that stuff kind of culminated into me, you know, adapting all of these things to my weird brain and, and working on really large projects for actually the largest healthcare um, payers largest healthcare systems. I've done 54 startups and about, I would say 50 of them were junk, but I had a couple of exits. I had a couple of good exits. And so it enabled me to buy homes and, 
and houses and, and, and cars and things like that and take care of myself, I look at it like I think it makes us unique and special, the things that we go through. And I think our mental models are important. And I think that there's a reason why people are excluding women and they're excluding people of color. I think there's a reason why they're excluding creative people and they're excluding people who, who present as having trauma or maybe neurodivergent. I don't think that it's an accident and I don't think it's out of ignorance. I think it's intentional. And so, um, in fact, I know it is. Um, but uh, all of that is to say that I discovered my, my place in, in the world um, of service design and research and specifically discovery research, heavy, heavy discovery. I don't care as much, and I'm not gonna lie to you, but I don't care as much about um, evaluative, about um, especially evaluative and digital. It's just not my thing. There's a lot of people who know that stuff and they're excellent at it. Dr. Nick is one of them and Debbie is another. There are plenty of people that are excellent at that stuff. But I, where I really shine is solving problems and looking at systemic issues, being able to zoom out, looking at that systems thinking kind of kind of thing, and 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 also understanding systematic. So like understanding that that big Google um kind of um uh, that Google ten thousand foot view, uh, Google Maps, and then zooming into the systematic issues and being able to break them up into chunks and so, and solve for those chunks. And so once I realized that people who think like me and are passionate about that stuff were called service designers, I started doing that. And so I started reading lots of books. I, I was self-taught. I was already doing it. I took a couple of classes from places like NNG and IDEO. And they, and those are great classes. Um, they're, they're not bad at all. Um, in fact, the IDEO one was pretty was, was really good. And so was the NNG. Um, there's also uh, uh, at the end of the at the end of this conversation, I'm going to share with you some of the places that you can go learn about service design on your own, because a lot of you are transitioning from other jobs. You need to do this remotely. You don't have tens of thousands of dollars to go to SCAD. Um, if you do, cool. I'm going to recommend places that you can go spend lots of money and go to school and get an official degree. If not, I'm going to tell you how you can go do it for virtually nothing. Um, so um there's that that was a long-winded spiel do you want to do you want me to talk a little bit more about what is service design and kind of how we do it uh yeah absolutely i'm thrilled to be asking uh, another question here um if you all want to type some things in the chat room that would be great because then we could see what some of your questions are you can also use the anonymous q a but i at least want to get in some foundational questions with thomas before we take the audience questions for example thomas if someone is watching this and it's their first exposure to service design how would you define and explain service design yeah okay that's an excellent question and that was uh that was where i was kind of hoping to go next so um it, it's real there's a lot of different things that are going on globally with service design and it's being done a little bit different in europe than it is here um so if you're in the states i'm going to tell you what i see and what i've seen in some of the largest organizations and how we're doing it here but to, to be really short, a uh, really simple, concise answer, service design is design leadership. It is the leadership of, of, of projects. It's the, and, and it basically is the intentional research and analysis and design of interactive touch points that customers have within our systems and services. And as service designers, our specific charge uh, is, is of solving problems and creating positive outcomes for customers, employees, uh, partners, membership partners, organization, uh, the organization itself, um, right? Because we want to make sure that we're helping the organization grow and, and prosper and profit, right? That, that's part of our job. And it's not a bad word to say that we're here to help the, the business profit, unlike a lot of the things that you read on LinkedIn. <laughs> so. Um, uh, all of that is is really uh, uh, exists in, in kind of around this framework of refining existing and designing new areas of service. Um, but we do it, we do it, like I mentioned before, with really deep discovery and learning and problem solving um, tools. And we do that also by considering, you know, the preferred futures of the people that we're doing, that we're solving for the humans and for the business, right? 
we want to make sure that everyone's getting their needs met. And I think the most important part of my, my spiel about what uh, service design is, is it's, it, I really want you to understand that this is getting thrown out right now. And Debbie and I, many people rant about this on LinkedIn, but please don't forget this. The more time we spend in discovery, the better your findings in future service delivery and solutions will be. The less time you spend in discovery, the more li likely you are to go build junk that, that's not solving real human human problems. And that's that's where we find ourselves today is people are skimping on that part and that's not cool. Um, <clears throat> so uh, basically service design is comprised of a lot of different types of design. Um, systems design, understanding um, the processes and defining those elements of a system, um, uh, you know, really, um, paying attention to developing those stakeholder expectations, how you're facilitating this stuff and going to learn about, you know, all of the moving parts in an ecosystem. What's that connective tissue? How, what's the dependencies? How do these things work with one another and depend on one another in order to function? And uh, how do we take a thing from a, a problem or a stated problem all the way to some type of um, solution and then all the way to some type of build and then output and release right into the wild. So that's systems design is really all about unpacking that stuff. Venture design is all about really understanding um, how to stand up new areas of business, new areas of service, how to stand up startups. Um, but usually within large organizations, it's just gonna be a new area of business or an LOB or something, right? A new offering. And that's when you hear a lot of this stuff online, um, when you see people talking about uh, business model canvases and you see um, value prop analysis and things like that. Those are really heavy for venture design is those types of artifacts. That's also important is understanding what artifacts and what uh, workshops to go with what. Um, we won't get into that because that's heavy, but I will sh share some books where you can find out, uh, find all of those types of things and those exercises and activities and you can learn all about them. Um, the next thing that service design really is, what did I cover, uh, is business design. Understanding how, to, how, how do we combine those tools of, of business thinkers, the business analysts, those, those, uh, those insights people, right, uh, strategists. Uh, like uh, one of my favorite strategists online and, re and reading his books is Roger Martin. I get a lot out of that guy. I think he's really smart. And if you want to know a lot about business and design strategy, he's your guy. Um, so um, it's all about understanding those different mindsets of design and all these different types of design that I'm talking about. Business designers kind of th think about how every element of the business model affects the customer experience and how, how, uh, the business profits and things like that. The next one, and this is not, this is really important, is organizational design. I, I have uh, I have my degree in that, and I'm basically uh, at the end of this year I'll be starting I'll be trying to finish uh, uh, my master's in organizational design from Harvard. Um, but there are five different types of organizational design principles. Right there's that specialization, the coordination with the business. There's uh, uh, our knowledge and our competence of organizational design, like those different types of tiers and hierarchies. We need to understand um, innovation and adaptation to, 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 to the things that happen in markets and, and things like that. And the different types of structures are, there's functional, uh, uh, divisional, uh, there's a flatarchy, and that's what, what's happening right now in matrix structures. So a flatarchy, is basically what is happening when um, uh, when you, all of you are probably, if you've been laid off or if you're dealing with stress at your job right now, you're going, what the hell is happening to me? What's happening to you is flatarchy. And the, the, how that works is they've started to treat research and design just in the last couple of years like, like development. And development cadences are you know, largely done on sprints. They're, they're, they, these are time box cadences right? And so you have a manager and then you have a bunch of individual contractors underneath it. It works just like a job foreman with your plumbers and your sheet rockers and your ditch diggers and your, and your carpenters, right? As, as there's a manager and then there's worker bees under it. And so what they've done is they've taken away the hierarchical, tongue to a twister early in the morning, the hierarchical structure of design leadership and that tiered 
kind of um, ladder so that the knowledge isn't flowing down anymore. And what they're, that's the reason why they're asking for player coaches is they're wanting old people like me and Joel Barr and, and Tom Walter and Debbie Levitt. They're wanting folks like us in their, in their 40s and 50s to come in and teach a bunch of 20 somethings how to do this work because they, they they don't know how to do it and it's okay to say this like I'm not being mean about this um, but they they asked for the three-legged stool and that's the only form of design that they were asking for and then they got it and all these boot camps arose and then what happened was they they, they started hemming and hawing once they got it like hey these folks don't know much <laughs> they need to they need to be um, they need to be blessed with some knowledge and they also need to be um, babysat sometimes and they also need to be um, upskilled. And so that's what's happening. Not talking shit. It's just the truth. Okay. So there's that. Um, and also what service design is, is it's basically foresight and futures thinking. Um, who are we now? Who do we intend to be a year from now? And what do we see on the horizons? Like what the hell is going on with AI and how are we going to adapt that stuff, um, you know, uh, into, into our workflows and, and, you know, where, where does it fit in? And, you know, what are our ethics around it? All of that kind of futures thinking of where to play, understanding where to play, um, new areas of opportunity. That's what uh, foresight is all about, futures thinking. Next up are, is behavioral design. Behavioral design and, and behavioral science, super important, understanding COMB, COMB journey mapping. This is really important, especially when you start talking about things like healthcare. A lot of the people on the call have healthcare backgrounds. I, I know that... Um, Annika uh, has done some healthcare. Joel, a couple of other people that I see, y'all, y'all are healthcare people. Well, you really need to understand behavioral design tactics, nudging, how all of that stuff works, um, and understanding like things like the social determinants of health, uh, why people get sick, why they don't take care of themselves, uh, things like that. So that's what um, that's what that 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 behavioral design element is all about when you start talking about you know, wanting people to do preferred behaviors and to be healthier and to do things that we want them to do, but also that are good for them, right? Like we're coming at it from that angle. We're not just trying to manipulate them and game them and do dark patterns and uh, extract their money and their time from them and their engagement, right? We're trying to do the right thing. Environmental design is also like physical design of products and, 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 and environments. And I'm, I'm about to talk in a second about one of the major differences between how Americans, how, how we're doing um, service design in America versus the UK. But one of those big things is like environmental design. How, how are spaces designed? When you go, when you walk into a store, the wayfinding, um, you know, what are those impulse buys right by the, right by the register? Is it chocolate? Is it a CD of your favorite Buddha bar? Uh, music, you know, if you've ever been in a Starbucks, they have music and they have chocolate and they have coffee beans and there's just stuff, you know, right by the register. Um, and there's also a way that you walk through um, stores. And if any of you have ever been into a, a crappy cafe or a bar and you walk in and the, and the register is right there or the, you know, there's no room to stand, well, that's just poor environmental design and that's part of service design. So, some honorable mentions and things that are really important and part and part of um, and part of design are, of course, change management, digital transformation, doing this stuff across UX, CX, EX, product design, and uh, really all of this stuff is about like a, a meta uh, kind of a, a more meta topic is risk management. The reason why we're doing this is we're trying to de-risk whatever it is that we're about to go design. We're trying to de-risk this shit because we don't want the business to go spend $2 million on a thing and have it be broken or worse, a hundred million. And I've seen that. Um, and what happens is when we don't do those, define those problem statements up front and we don't really understand, we don't get key alignment on the opportunity and uh, the identification of the opportunity, it is about a 90% chance you're going to go build junk. Actually, it's a 90, it's verified. It's a 95% chance <laughs> that you're going to fail. And that, um, and that is a huge issue. So does anybody have any questions about what I just, 
mentioned. I, I kind of left off some of the stuff like uh, there's trust building and collaborative co-design. It's all rooted in co-design, but you know. Yeah, um, I want to jump in. Um, we have a zillion questions in the chat room, so I want to read them out to you, but I'm going to lovingly request the lightning version of your answers because there are so many questions and okay. typically the webinar ends in about 20 minutes, so I get the feeling we'll go a little late, but um, see if you can possibly do the lightning answer version, not the, you know, 10 minute answer. No offense. I mean, I love all the detail you've given. I just scheduled this as like a 45 minute thing. And so it's going to go fast. So I'm going to ask, ask you some of these questions out of the order in which they came in, but we'll get to everybody's. Liz wants to know if service design is similar to UX strategy with more of a leadership lens. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would say typically when we talk about users, um, user experience and user centricity, we're talking about digital. We're talking about uh, interacting with things like websites and, 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 and mobile apps and software and things like that. Uh, this gets confused a lot. And, and uh, I think a lot of people argue about this topic a lot. But I really like, you know, the notion of calling our customers customers first. And here's the thing. Um, it's interesting because Larry, Larry Marine and I were on a thread just a few days ago where we were talking about this very thing. And the reason why I don't like calling everyone a user is upfront. This might sound corny, but I don't know too many people that are referred to as a user other than addicts, junkies people who are, and that's really what a lot of social media and a lot of these apps are trying to create. They're trying to create addicts. And so I don't like the term user, I never have. And, and we can split hairs over terminology all day, but I think it's really important to understand the distinction in a large organization that a, a passive consumer is not a user. A passive consumer that we haven't yet um, onboarded and brought is not and brought on online and onboarded is not a user yet okay a a, a a an active consumer who might be readily looking for our solution or our service is not yet a user a onboarded customer is not yet a user in fact really they only become users once they're actively participating and using our website using a service they're buying things online and i can give you 50 examples of people in healthcare that never interact with apps. They never interact with websites and um, they call in when they have problems or with their Medicare, their Medicaid and things like that. So there's that. Thanks, I'm gonna jump back in because we have so many questions. I wanna go to Asena's question, which was, what would you say is the difference between product owners and managers and service designers? Uh, so that's really very similar to the previous question. Um, the, 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 the previous question um, was very much in line. Uh, so a PM is basically, in, uh, in my experience, um, is a job foreman that manages products, right? And what I just mentioned with, the, you know, when Debbie told me to give, give you the two cent answer instead of the 10 cent answer, because I went too long. I went over systems design, venture design, business design, organizational design, foresight, um, futures, behavioral design, environmental design. Trust me when I tell you PMs don't know anything about any of that stuff. They don't know the first thing about any of it. Sometimes, but rarely. Um, uh, let's also jump in with Catherine's question. Does the jobs to be done model support the discovery process in your work? Yes, JTBDs. JTBDs, um, I'm doing some right now actually with a, with a project and, you know, understanding those kind of like um, primary jobs and social jobs and, and defining that stuff and defining markets is really important with certain types of businesses. Um, uh, job stories, I, I do use those. A lot of people are, are don't like story mapping and stories, but I like job stories and I use them uh, quite often. And typically when you, when you start out doing a JTB, when you start out do doing your jobs to be done, it's, your, your, it's a certain way that you ask questions in interviews and then how you map that stuff. And there's different types of, um, um, uh, maps and wheels of progress and things like that and defining markets. But yes, uh, I, I use JTBDs often and they are of value. Great, thank you. Um, Kaylee Carpenter says, 
what other roles do service designers work with when doing a project and how do you work together? All of them. And that's an excellent question. And I didn't get to touch on that, but I was, I was, I mentioned it lightly is it service design at its core is really all about collaboration and co-design. And the most critical thing you can really understand um, within the business uh, construct is understanding the power in politics and how power in politics works. And the way that we do that typically, uh, write this down, is you really want to do strong stakeholder management and stakeholder mapping. And you also want to do power mapping. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you really quick what both of those things do. S stakeholder mapping shows us who has the, the power to, to kibosh our project or to support our project or whatever it is that we're doing. You always want that buy-in from the top. But there's always going to be people who are soured on working with um, designers or working with consultants or working with um, people who are change managers, right? People don't like change. <laughs> Why can't we just keep doing it the same way we always have? I, I like my paycheck where I get up every day and I do the same thing. I don't like change. And so those kinds of people, you need to know who they are and you need to know how to talk to them. But when we power map, what we quickly find out is, hey, that CEO or that VP or that, that you know, that, the highest paid person in the room, that's not always who the real player is. Sometimes it's their admin. Sometimes it's someone who's just adjacent to them who knows where all the bodies are and the skeletons are and knows how to get, knows how to get things done and has more sway. So you need the power map and see where that power lies, right? So that's, that was an excellent question. And also that's how you trust, you build trust with, um, within the organization. Um, Maureen says, does service design apply to interior design for businesses? It's funny that you mentioned that. Yes, that's what environmental design is. And that's, so let me, let me, uh, you're, you're giving me the opportunity to, to explain this real quick. Mark Fontaine has the service design show and one of his famous quotes is, you know, the service design is basically the difference between two coffee shops that are across the street from one another and you go into one versus the other, that that difference and that ex that 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 call of experience is basically what service design is. Well, here's the thing in the United States of America, I would say in the largest organization where service design is functioning right now at this moment is a roughly about 70 to 80 percent of us work on product teams and digital teams. The other 20 or 30 uh, percent work on CX teams. A lot, we are not doing heavy retail. How do you know that we're not doing heavy retail? Because, and, and this is what Europe, like the Nordic folks and the people in Northern Europe, they, they do a lot of service design in retail. They do a lot of um, social stuff and government stuff work. And they also do a lot of academia. Like that's where the, the largest portion of their service design is being done. And that's what they write about a lot. But the thing is, is if you're following the news and you know anything about what's happening in the States, um, retail is shutting down. It's not doing well. It hasn't been doing for well for 20 years. And and so there's, there's you know, Montgomery Ward, Sears, JCPenney, uh, Toys R Us. And just yesterday, I saw that 50 or 60 um, Best Buys are closing down. We're increasingly more and more, as Americans, we're isolating. We're buying things online. We're buying things online. We are not, um, we're not purchasing um, things in stores a lot. So doing the checkout stuff, it's all self-checkout. Doing this, uh, we, we just don't do a lot of service design that way anymore. But yeah, uh, that, that's in, in Europe, they do a lot of that wayfinding and, you know, um, all of that stuff, merchandising, store merchandising. They do a lot of service design in that regard, but I don't know too many people in the United States that are doing that. Yeah, I agree. We've had some other service designers on the show and they've all been from or in Europe. And I know there's a big service design university, I think in Copenhagen. There's, there's so, several of them. Yeah. Burgett Major, I think is the a professor there. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, that's, that's who I keep running into. Um, all the Italians going to Copenhagen to do the university there. Um, Mike asks, curious to how you take findings from the discovery to take action and how you get the business on board to support your strategy. Right. So you're, that's a, that's a really deep question and that could be a workshop or a long conversation in and of itself, but let me try to see if I can give you the short version. So basically, when I start a project, I have a project intake process and I'm, 
I, I've been threatening to upload this for like six months. I, I have a Miro board and a Fig Jam board I'm going to make um, to upload. And uh, if if you keep watching this um, uh, channel of Debbie's, I'll post it within the next few days and I'll just make it. Um, but it, it exists already. So I, I do this really deep kind of intake um, strategy. And when I do that intake strategy, I get those business and technical assumptions. I find out what opportunities we're targeting. I understand, you know, um, what where our biggest service risks are. Where are those? What are those moments that matter and pain points that we think are happening? I gather all of that data with the customer, along with the customer member assumptions, and along with the design assumptions. That helps me build out my my brief my uh, research brief or what I'm, what it is that I'm gonna go do, that in turn helps me um, create, and I usually do this with other people, right? I, I bring in other stakeholders, and from there, I'm able to create some type of light hypothesis map rooted in data. We don't just willy-nilly do this by guesswork. We do this based on knowns, unknowns, and we establish and tag what we do know based on data versus what we're just assuming. And that helps me to go create a good, strong um, um, research brief or design brief about what it is that I'm going to go dig and find out and how I can plot out the next 30, 60, 90 days of discovery. And what I do is once I, 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 I find out, I, go, I usually go interview folks um, in, in the context of whatever it is that I'm researching. Um, and I create archetypes and those sorts of things. I create the holy trifecta of service design, which are some type of persona or archetype with some type of customer journey along with a blueprint. And what those different things do is, um, you know, the persona and archetype allows us to understand the person uh, that's going through the issue. The customer journey is those steps and touch points and things that they're interacting with, you know, along with the different swim lanes of of um of and, and of of the things that they're they're going through and dealing with and the service blueprint has the top part of the journey in it but the second the back part is basically the bottom part half of the of the uh, lens is basically what the business is going through and once you unpack all of that and you kind of show those you know those moments that matter and understanding the unique the operational high value customer, employee, partner, and business stuff, uh, uh, and you really indicate where your friction and your toxicity is happening, that usually you can align those things with like a, a specific business OKRs or blue chips. You can align, you can create new KPIs um, and, and really illustrate to the business, hey, this is costing us money and this is how much money it's costing. I put a dollar amount to it and uh, we believe that you know, these are our three solutions. Let's 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 prioritize them, and then let's get them in front of people. And once people start giving us feedback, and we start learn, we learn, we do a learn launch, which is a proto like a prototype launch of service or a digital prototype, whatever it is. And we learn from that. That will indicate you know which one should bubble up to the primary position of being our best solution. So I know that was a long ass answer, but that was a really deep question that you asked. <laughs> You're right. That could absolutely be its own webinar, if that, not yeah. a course or, or book series. Um, we've got a question from Marvin that asks, have you seen some good examples of service design portfolios? Uh, yeah, mine's pretty kick-ass. Where can we find it, Thomas? It's hidden behind a, behind a password, but I'll show it to you. If you want to reach out, we can do it after this. But yeah, so I always show the problem. I always show um, uh, it's much different than a UX. Uh, well, actually it's similar to a UX portfolio, but you're gonna have a lot more artifacts and a lot more tables and graphs and a lot more stickies and things like that. Uh, more personas and archetypes and journey maps, lots of, uh, more, more process mapping usually. Um, and sometimes at the end of that, I'll show screens of specific digital output if it, if it was for software or for web, right? Um, but yeah, it'll be way more heavy on the discovery and the, and the front end research. Um, but you can design it in the same way. But what I like to do is for every project I do, I usually do a deck. Sometimes I do two or three decks, depending on who I'm sharing it with. Sometimes if it's for, uh, um, uh, let's just say business stakeholders or, 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 um, or uh, C-suite, 
I'll have different decks for different people. And I'll put that deck in there that you can just scroll through and then I'll show the artifacts and I'll tell the story on the left side, show the artifacts on the right side, but I'm happy to show that to y'all if you want. Yeah, but I would have to say maybe that's a reason. Maybe you can send me some resources. We'll put them in the YouTube description because this will be recorded and go up on YouTube and people will be able to find some of Thomas's helpful stuff in the description. Um, Corian, sorry, I'm pronouncing everybody's names badly. It's not on purpose. Uh, says, can you please elaborate on backstage versus support processes in service blueprinting? Yeah, so... Typically, um, what we have in the, in the top in the top lens is you have those service customers, right? Um, uh, that's going to be our persona, our archetype, our hero. What are they going through? What are they interacting with as far as um, the, the choreography of those touch points, the time, right? Um, and next, you have the service users. The sometimes service customers and service users are two different people. Um, in the front stage is usually our service employees like who who is it that's interacting with the hero uh, is that it, like if they're they're at a clinic or a cafe for instance or something like that it's gonna those are gonna be our employees right those service employees backstage service employees are those are gonna be people that make things happen behind the scenes and like the back office management stuff maybe they're processing payments maybe they're making sure uh, things go smoothly with a, you know, um, uh, other, other, other systems. You know what I mean? If you have partner processes and partners like healthcare is, is, is a great example. So is FinTech. They have lots of different partners and processes and those things. Some of them are automated and, but some of them are, you know, humans are involved. So understanding those where they fit in and where they come in, in and out of the story and uh, via those touch points is really critical. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, before our next question, I just want to say um, emojis up, everybody. Who's listening to Thomas talking and feeling like, oh, my God, I was born to do this job? Because I know that's how I feel. Like, this is absolutely in my blood, in my personality, in my everything. Yeah, um, everyone emojis up. Um, Maggie, if you can please type your question in the chat room if it's possible, just because I'm trying to collect everybody's questions there and we're running out of time so quickly. Technically, we've got about five more minutes. So let me ask you Jose's question, which was, do you know of service designers working with small NGOs? Um, no, uh, I don't. Um, I know that um, Harmonic Design does a lot of uh, stuff with, um, with, uh, with uh, smaller companies and even nonprofits and things like that. Um, but uh, I, most of the people I know that they do service design are in large organizations. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, as we wrap, I, I'm going to wait for Maggie's question to hit the chat room, but I think it is our last question. I think I got everybody else's question. We've only got a few more minutes. I think I put this down as 45 minutes long, so I, I do want to try to wrap up on time for people who might have back-to-back uh, -back calls or something. So Thomas, tell us a little bit about how people can find you, connect with you, get in touch with you. Uh, is there something we can buy from you other than your music? So, so give every Everybody, all of the the links and places yeah you can find me on LinkedIn if you hit me up uh, if you hit me up uh, on uh, LinkedIn I'll walk you through my portfolio and show it to you maybe we can do this as a big group thing too but uh, Debbie if we have just five or six minutes I'd like to tell folks where they can go learn about service design and the books that they can read Please, I know my audience always wants to hear that. I'm going to also remind people that your LinkedIn is Thomas Ian Wilson because uh, you might find some other Thomas Wilsons out there. So look for uh, LinkedIn and then at the end of the URL, Thomas Ian Wilson. Um, yes, I, I know that you and I will disagree on some of these, but I'll stay quiet today. So go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I want to be clear, if you're, if you're younger and you can move around and you have the finances, you can go to schools like SCAD. There's a lot of there's a lot of programs um, um, that you can do. You can also, but there's a lot you can do. Let's say you already have a bachelor's and you want your master's. Stanford has an excellent innovation um, and and design degree for a master's, and it's pretty. From what I understand, it's very well respected and it's a good program. And um, uh, also, there's lots of places you can learn organizational and industrial psychology you can take that from a, a smaller school like csu or 
or, or uh, Phoenix, you know what I mean? Uh, all those kinds of places have has that degree and you can, and that's a good degree to have and it's very uh, applicable. Um, but you can also get on, you can read a lot of books. You can get on Udemy. You can also get on um, interactiondesign.org. But I'm going to tell you a few books that have really changed my life. I mean, I, I've probably read a hundred about design and uh, human-centered design and, and, and psychology and service design. But these are the ones that really left a mark, right? So the Innovator's Toolkit is an excellent book, kick-ass book. 50 different types of techniques that are in this book. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you that these specific books is they're practical application books. They're not books filled with words. They're books filled with artifacts and how to do this stuff, right? So this is about doing, not, you know, uh, chopping it up and talking about it. This one is by a friend of mine. Uh, David Gray and Sonny Brown wrote uh, Game Storming. And this is all about different techniques, gamification. And she's um, she's a good friend of mine, and I care about her a lot. But this is a kick-ass book. Get this book. It'll help. These three books um, came out. Um, uh, Mark Stickdorn and Adam St. John Lawrence. This is service design methods. These are the exact methods and some of the things that I just finished talking about, but a whole lot more. This is how you do them. It's It's got a, a whole lot of like the time it takes, how you do it, how you get these things done. This is the first one, I think, the service design thinking. But this one is really in critical too. This is the, the revised version, service design doing. This is service design doing. This is one of the most important books. You're gonna, you're gonna get a lot out of this book. This is one that I don't think gets mentioned enough. The women in service design and in human-centered design don't get enough publicity, in my opinion. This is one of the coolest ladies in design, Jean Leitko. She wrote, this book is really powerful. It's called Designing for Growth. And this book comes with Designing for Growth. And it is all practical applications and pictures and uh, artifacts that you can apply. And actually, if you download it, I'm pretty sure she has this in the PDF. She has the actual um, uh, tools. The last one is a book that's a little bit different. It's not 100% service design, but it's important. This is a guy that started DuckDuckGo, I believe. His name is uh, uh, Weinberg. Uh, and super thinking is all about mental models. And what we started off talking about is really understanding how to build teams based on our mental models and our unique experiences. And that's the thing that's most important for me to leave with you, you know, um, is that we, we, we have a whole lot of sameness in tech and we have a whole lot of sameness in design. And um, we need to combat that stuff and we need to combat it by, by accepting people who are a little bit more neurodivergent. We need to have more people who represent the LGBTQ community. We need to have more people of color. We need to have a hell of a lot more women so um, the bottom line is read this stuff and really respect people's mental models. You know what I mean? Not every man who rambles like I just did and, uh, is a mansplainer. Some of them just have fucking autism. Uh, so um, there's that. That seems like an amazing place to end. That, that was uh, a ending with the power. So um, we're going to wrap it up there so we can wrap it up on time. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Remember, we've got so many free webinars planned for you uh, for months to, to come. Uh, they're on different topics. Some of them are interviews. Some are discussions that I'm leading or techniques that I teach. They're Nearly all of them are free. So check them out at cxcc.to slash events. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the calendar, you're not put on a mailing list. RSVPing does not put you on a mailing list. Of course, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, CXCC, which stands for Customer Experience, Customer Centricity. And I hope people will check out the Patreon to be the first to know some of the things we're doing here. So thank you. We I think at, our, at the height of this, we had uh, about 50 people here, and that was a wonderful turnout. So thanks to everybody who gave us some time today, but especially Thomas for your fantastic information and answers. I wish we could go in so much deeper. I could definitely see you writing a course on this. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Hit me up, and I'll take you through my portfolio, and I'll send you some links. Excellent. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, thanks again. Thanks so much, you guys. Bye-bye.